you joined us this morning so we can uh, lift our voices and sing our praises. We're going to start off this morning with, um, this is like Easter set part two. There was only so much music we could do last week. So, so I just plugged in the other songs that I wish I could have done for Easter. So we're going to continue to celebrate the fact that Christ our Savior is risen. So I invite you to stand up as we start off our service singing Glorious Day.
check out our Life at Adventure. Good morning, Adventure family. Welcome to Life at Adventure. It is the week after Easter, and I am looking forward to bringing the joy from last week and settling into this new sermon series, The Fellowship. As always, if you're interested in deepening your study of what we're going through in each sermon, we have coordinating daily prayers that get posted at 8 a.m. each day on our website, our app, and Facebook, or you can pick up a packet of them at each end of the building. We also have life group curriculum you can use on your own or with a group, and a digging deeper guide as well. You can find these on our website at faithadventure.com slash current dash messages. Um, on our app on the This Week tab, or you can pick up a paper copy here at church. This Wednesday, April 27th, Base Camp will be hosting an all-church night of bingo. Bring your dinner and join us at 5.30 p.m., and bingo kicks off at 6. Who could use just an evening of fun? I could, so I'll see you there. In Adventure Kids, I'm learning about the, telling the world about God. She talked to two people about God. You can learn about his Af his trip to Africa, Africa too. Hi, I'm Jennifer, the Outreach Director here at Adventure. And as I said last week, I'm so excited to share about what we have coming up for our missions in May. Our Outreach Department is combining forces with our midweek program for the whole month. If you haven't attended base camp before, or it's been a while, this is the perfect opportunity to jump in. We start all of them at 5.30 on Wednesday evenings. First off, we recently sent a team to Africa, so we're kicking off our month on the 4th by hosting a celebration and serving Senegalese hamburgers and sharing about our missions there. You don't want to miss it. The next week, we're focusing on how Adventure partners with local ministries that serve our community. We'll have dinner together and then head out with your families or small groups on a video scavenger hunt. Yes, there will be prizes. The third week, we will be sharing about how we're all called to be missionaries in our own spaces at home, work, and school. Of course, we will feed you again before sending you out on mystery missions with your families or small groups. The last week has been two years in the making. We are bringing back our famous chili cook-off to support ministry in Mazelong. We need people to come ready to eat, of course, but if you're wanting to enter your chili, make sure you connect with Tanya to get on the score sheet. Just so you know, Callie reminds us all that she is the reigning champion and has worn the crown for the longest, I will say by default, <laughs> because of COVID. She's ready to defend her title though. So dust off your chef's hats and be ready to bring the heat on May 25th. With all of these events, it can make life much easier for us if we can get a head count. So please register either at the Welcome Center online or using the link in the newsletter or on Facebook. Thanks again, and we can't wait to see you on Wednesdays in May. If you're looking for ways to connect and settle in here with our adventure family after all the festivities of Easter, don't forget our weekly rhythms of prayer night on Tuesdays, scripture out loud on Thursdays, and adventure equip classes before church on Sundays. Find more details for these in our newsletter or visit the Welcome Center. Last but not least, next Sunday is our Family Worship Sunday, where we embrace being a church family and worshiping alongside our youngest members. We also are celebrating baptisms next week and are excited to have our kids with us to witness that as well. And with that, whether you're in the Worship Center, the Friendship Center, live with us online, or later on YouTube or the app, we're just so glad that you've chosen to join us in worship today. All right, and if you'd um, listen to our call to confession and then join us in the prayer of confession, that will be up on your screens. The call to confession is from Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, 
and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Please join me in a prayer of confession. Lord Jesus, fill us with your spirit today. We are running this race loaded down with sinful desires, idolatrous hearts, and mountains of guilt and shame that we pile on ourselves and each other. We confess to you that our frantic activity springs more from strategies of self-salvation than from real sorrow over sin and love for you. Our running takes us far away from the forgiveness, peace, and rest you freely give us. Train our hearts to run to you instead of away from you. Forgive us our attempts to save ourselves. Fill us with your spirit so that we become preoccupied with your holy work and presence. May your love and kindness captivate our minds and imaginations, strengthen our weak faith, and motivate us to leave behind the sins that so easily entangle us. Yours is the majesty, the glory, and the kingdom forever and ever. Amen. If you'd like to stand or stay seated um, for this next song, whichever is appropriate, it says, Be still my soul.
this morning that you would that you would still our souls quiet our spirits that we might hear your voice more clearly that we may be drawn to following you more closely now that the things that we need to confess are things that we're willing to give over to you and that they would not come between our relationship with our loving father thank you for the grace that you've given us for the opportunity to hand over the things that are separating us from you, God, and the promise that you offer of forgiveness, of grace, um, and that you'll, you'll always be there, God. This morning, as we are entering into a time of um, the sermon, I want to pray for Pastor CJ, that you would be giving him the words that we need to hear this morning, that, uh, that, he would, that you would speak through him, and that we would hear you clearly. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Introduction. Noun. A preliminary portion to the main text where the context and subject matter is introduced. Introductions also give purposes for reading a piece of text and advice as to how to go about reading it. As you listen to the following text, consider the context in which these words were written and the purpose for their writing for the community of faith. And they, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Good morning. Good morning. So this next series is going to be 15 weeks of going through Acts 2, yeah, we're still in Acts 2, 42 through 47. But it's going to be broken up into like five mini-series within the overarching series, so it won't hopefully feel like we're doing one 15-week run. These uh, first two weeks are going to be introductions uh, to the text where we find some context for the passages that we're going to study, as well as lenses with which we should be looking at the passage so that we, as we study, we don't miss what the Holy Spirit is teaching through Luke. Uh, the title of today's uh, sermon is uh, The Framework and the Formula. Uh, I hope to essentially give two separate but connected sermons on the framework that this section is broken into and the formula for how the early church engaged scripture, So, because that's what we're going to be doing over the course of these 15 weeks and ongoing. So uh, to start us off, I want to go kind of backwards. So I should have called it The Formula and the Framework, because I want to start with the formula. Uh, for the next several weeks, the sermon introduction videos will be different people reading Acts 2, 42 through 47 out loud. So we're going to invite teens and kids and adults to video themselves reading this scripture aloud with us, and they'll be in the intro videos. If you would like to make a video where you get to participate, uh, just email sam at sam at faithadventure.com and let her know you'd like to do it. So it's a really simple, easy thing to do. Uh, we tend to read out of the ESV version. It doesn't matter. It's just the one I, uh, I read out of, and since that's the one I quote up here, that tends to be the one everyone reads out of, but you can read out whatever you like. Part of the reason we're doing this is because the, the practice of public reading of Scripture out loud and then discussing it is, is the formula by which God's people have studied the Bible since, really, the beginning of the Bible. The, the first occurrence of this was way back in the book of Deuteronomy. So if you have your Bibles, uh, could you turn to the book of De De Deuteronomy with me? If you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand. Someone will bring you one. Um, if you start at Genesis, open up the Bible, right, page one. Uh, Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible. Uh, and we're going to pick things up 
in chapter 6, verse 1. If you're reading on one of the Blue Bibles, it's on page 87 or 168. So there's your little cheater if you don't know where it is. It's uh, also on the app if you use that too. Uh, So Moses, he's the author of these first five books of the Bible, tells the Israelites gathered there about the importance of these books for their lives. Deuteronomy is like a long sermon. Um, And he's telling them how important these books are. He says, now this is the commandment, the statues and rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. So Moses is talking about all that he's written, and it isn't just the Ten Commandments. It isn't the 613 laws. It's all of it. It's the songs, the poems, the stories that he's included in these five books of the Torah. Uh, when, he's, uh, when, he, when, you think of, when we think of rules and statutes, we kind of tend to think of a list of things that tells us exactly what we can and cannot do. We need to understand that this is a very modern, a very Western way of looking at things. Ancient law codes weren't always written as a list of rules. Often they were found in stories. Grimm's Fairy Tales was written by two lawyers. They were to be stories that communicated law. They were, that, that was the intent. We look at them as children's stories, and most of us don't read them to our kids because they're super scary. <laughs> Biblical narratives were written to educate God's people. Moses here declares that the things he'd written all were written down and learned from and obeyed and to be submitted to. They were designed to teach the Israelites how to live as God's people. They were stories with an intended purpose, which is why he continues in verse 1. He says, uh, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you're going over, to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, that you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it might, may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. So note that these stories, these texts, these scripture has a purpose, and there's lots of them, so that uh, they may do them in their new land, that they may fear the Lord, that they may be carried from generation to generation, that their days may be long, that things may go well for them, that they may greatly uh, multiply in the promised land. So these words are meant to be learned and memorized and obeyed by God's people. He says that in the following prayer, he teaches them the Shema, the, this prayer that the Jewish people would say and still say today, every day, three times a day. In verse 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. Note that he says sit when you walk and when you lie, doing all the things that you do. You're going to talk about them all day long. Verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be like frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. He's saying these words are important. They're to be heard, memorized, talked about, taught, discussed, and used as reminders about how we're to live as God's people. The rest of the book of Deuteronomy is a restatement. You'll read, if you read Deuteronomy all the way through, you're like, wait, I already read this in the first four books. Why is it repeating it here again? It's a restatement of the scripture, the laws, the attributes of God's character, the mighty works that he'd done for his people. This was to be a regular practice for God's people. In fact, towards the end, in Deuteronomy 31, um, he says that he, he tells them about celebrating this thing called Sukkot or the Feast of Booths. And it says in verse 10 on verse 30, or chapter 31, it says, Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, at the set time of the year, release at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord, at the, at, uh, your God, at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. They're going to read through all of these first five books. In verse 12, he says, assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, kids, and the sojourner within your town. So people who don't even know, people who are traveling through, bring them too, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the law, the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. This was for everybody, men, Women, children, even foreigners in the land, the the scriptures might be known and passed on generation to generation. 
The practice of public reading of scriptures, it comes up again and again throughout the entirety of the Bible. After this section, the Israelites move into the promised land. And then in Joshua 8, the the first thing that Joshua does is he reads God's law aloud to them as they go in. But as they go in and they start to possess this promised land, they start to forget who their God is. They forget to read the words out loud. And as time goes on, they forget the scriptures and they forget their God. Who they are as his people and how they are to live. And then things start to go badly. And that's an understatement. Then in 2 Kings 23, a high priest finds a, a copy of the Torah on the wall of the house of the Lord. you remember this? Josiah gets a hold of it, King Josiah, and he reads it. And then he invites all the inhabitants of Jerusalem to hear it read out loud. And things start to turn around. They start to get, this is like a highlight. They go, yay, this is a good time in 2 Kings. And then they start to forget again. And then Jerusalem is sacked. And the Israelites are taken off into captivity. Eventually, a remnant comes back and builds a wall around Jerusalem, seeking to return to what they once were as a people. They pause, and again, they read through the scriptures aloud as this remnant community of God. This continued throughout history into the New Testament as well. The scripture reading was a staple of the synagogue meetings every week. This practice provided a a strategic opportunity for Jesus and Paul. Remember, where's the first place they went to when they went to a new city? The synagogue. And they participated in this public reading of scripture. And then they got to discuss it with the people that were there. The reading of scriptures aloud is a a practice highlighted throughout the Bible from Torah to Revelation. In fact, Revelation closes with these heavy words and expectation that the scriptures would be read aloud for the community of faith. In Revelation 22, it says, uh, verse 18, it says, I warn everyone who hears, okay, so because it's spoken aloud, the words of the prophecy of this book, If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. That's all the scary stuff in Revelation. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So clearly, clearly, God's people, this is the thing God's people are supposed to do. Uh, We are supposed to gather and read aloud scriptures. And my, my question, I guess, initially was why? Why, though? It makes sense for an ancient audience where most people couldn't read, right? That makes sense. You have to come together. You have to read it out loud so that way everybody can learn it. And they learn it and memorize it. And they had to because they didn't have it so readily available to them. Now, we think that in our modern society, everyone can read. What's the benefit of this? And I want to start by saying, I think we need to pump the brakes a little bit on saying, assuming that everyone can read. Let's, let's, let's slow down on that a little bit. Uh, We live in a country where we teach most people how to create words and meaning out of letters. That's true. But I would say we need to own that we also live in a culture where many can read, but choose not to. Um, I read a statistic, actually my wife turned me on to this a few weeks ago, saying that most people don't ever read another whole book again after high school. That's a statistic for America. we, have a lot, we live in a culture where most people can read, but they don't. Um, and those who do read may not understand what it is they're reading. They don't know how to read critically. They don't know how to read different genres of, of like poetry. We don't teach that anymore. Most of the time, we want, and I say we because this is all of us, we want quick answers to things, and so we want to read an interpretation of something. So we want someone just to tell us what it means and tell us what we're supposed to do. Give me the quick answer. I don't want to chew on it. I don't want to disseminate it. I don't want to think about lots of different things. I just want you to tell me what to do. Can I do this or can I not do this? I get a lot of uh, is it a sin to blank questions all the time. And I always like, dude, it's so much more complicated than that. It's so much more complicated. Reading the word of God out loud is a practice that can help us, like it's helped God's people throughout history. And, And there's at least four things that happen when we read the word aloud in community. We're reminded who our God is. That's one thing. We're reminded of who we are. We're reminded of who we're called to be. And then we're reminded about what God is doing in the world, this kingdom of heaven idea, which is very foreign to us. We're reminded of these four things. Now, throughout history, if we go even after the Bible, biblical era, we can follow trends when the church got away from public readings of scripture and it found itself in places it never desired to be. If you remember when the Catholic church and the Christian church were synonymous with one another, right? There was this long time when lay people couldn't read the scriptures, right? Oftentimes, the the scriptures were read out loud in Latin, not the common language. And people were told what they meant. And things got, it was very privatized. Interpretation was privatized to a very select few. And things went awry. 
And, and, and then the Bible began to be printed in the language of the people. And remember, when the language started getting printed in the language of the common language of people, German and English, people died for that. Let me rephrase that. People were killed for that by the church. Now, I don't want to get too down in our modern culture, but one of my biggest fears is that we're going to find ourselves in a generation of Christ's followers who've relegated scriptures and translation, interpretation, and application to a select few, the professionals with the fancy hats. Those are the people. This leads to churches full of people that aren't equipped to be able to handle biblical texts. So we develop a belief that, honestly, I mean, I think the, the worst thing I hear a lot is that the Bible is boring. And it's heartbreaking to me. Because it's far from boring. And if we're honest with ourselves, it's because we just don't know how to read it. Now, let's just be really, really honest, okay? Um, have you ever, during your devotional time, maybe in the morning or in the evening, um, and you're reading the Bible, and you read some story, you read some passage, and you look up from that passage and you say, yeah, I don't get it. Anybody? Okay, everyone's hand should be up. And if your hand's not up, come on up. You can just, I'll just get off and you can do this. Because I can't, every, it happens all the time, right? It happens, I don't get it, okay? What do most of us do in situations like that? Move on. I love that. That was perfect. Move on. We close the book and we check the box. Okay, I did my devotional this morning. I have no idea what that means. I just read words off of a page. We say, maybe we say, glory be to God, or this is the word of God, and then move on, Right? And it's because it's all we know how to do. And I'm not saying this is bad, but we should chew on these things during the day. And this is why this idea of, of reading scripture aloud and in community is so important. In fact, if you read by yourself, I would encourage you to read it out loud as well. You get more meaning. You gain more meaning from reading it out loud. Now, we can read alone, but reading with people and discussing it, what we read is so important. It's something we can do with people of all ages, it says. Men and women and children can all participate in this practice, regardless of their familiarity with the Bible or their maturity in faith. I love to read the Bible with people who've never read it before because they don't gloss, gloss over the things that we just take for granted. We'll read something like, oh yeah, Jesus healed this person and then he went on to this next place and we go, oh yeah, that just happens. That's what Jesus does. They're like, wait, uh, that's not normal. You know that, right? <laughs> people don't just heal people every day. Did that just say that Paul's shadow or Peter's shadow healed people? Yeah, that's weird. You know that, right? Right. You know, Jesus raised from the dead. Yeah, that's, that's not normal. We should probably pause there for a minute and maybe just talk about, like, is this fiction or nonfiction? You know, they, they ask good questions. And when we do this in, in, a, in a group, in a community, we illuminate aspects of the text that we never would have seen on our own. But in practice, just practically, how do we do this? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> in the scriptures, they pre prescribe, overarching, five five aspects of the public reading of scripture, okay? Uh, one is declaration. The next is translation. The next is interpretation, application, and then celebration. Um, it starts with the declaration of, of scripture, and I would encourage you big sections, big sections if you can do it. Don't just do, we tend to do, I mean, I know we're focusing on Acts 2, 42 through 47. It's five verses. You're like, CJ, come on, man. But uh, the idea is like, big, pick up a bigger section. Look, read up for breadth. The Hebrew people would sit and listen to the entire teaching of those five books of the Torah, which would take all day long. It took several days sometimes. Uh, do you know that uh, you could read the entire Bible, every word out loud in 70 hours and 40 minutes? Do you know you can read the new, whole New Testament in 18 hours and 20 minutes? Okay, I want to put this in perspective. Don Van Dornick, I don't know if you guys were here on Easter Sunday last week, he thought this whole series was going to be about the Fellowship of the Ring. Do you remember that video? If you haven't seen it, it's really funny. It's hilarious. Um, it's church humor at its finest. But uh, it's, uh, he thought it was about this, the, the Fellowship of the Ring. How many of you have seen those movies? If you decided to watch all three Hobbit movies and all three Lord of the Rings movies, do you know how long that would take you? 20 hours and 18 minutes. You could read the whole New Testament in that time frame. <laughs> anyway, so the first step of reading Scripture out loud is what? Scripture. Reading Scripture out loud. Oh. Shocking, I know. Okay, It's very confusing. What's step two? Translation. Whew. This is a word we don't like. I don't like translation. But translation, what it means is that when we read it in public, we pause occasionally to help it make sense, to ask questions about meaning. We don't just gloss over something if we read something and say, well, that's weird. We don't try to find meaning. 
That comes later. We don't try to apply it. That comes later. But what we try to do is just go, what is this saying? What is the text saying? We seek to answer the question, what's the author saying here? Think about the context. Who is saying it? Where is he saying it? Why might they be saying it? Do you understand what you're reading? Not just reading the words, but do you understand what it is that's going on, especially in a narrative? This is a time when we ask questions about what the author meant and why he may have written it. Okay? Again, try to steer clear of, of, of how you apply it, because I know that, that, that's pushed heavily. And we want to get there, but just talk about it. What's happening? The next thing we do is interpret the text. Uh, the Bible is Jewish meditation literature. We need to recognize that. It's meant to be meditated on. It's meant to be chewed on. It's meant to be ingested and then talked about in biblical community. It's intended to be discussed and wrestled with. It's interpretations where we can start to have diversity in our understanding of the text. And that's okay. Often in Bible studies, what I like to say is, uh, what stands out to you? Instead of what does it mean or what should we do with it, what stands out to you? That's an interpretation question. Uh, sometimes what stands out to us, what the Spirit highlights for us, isn't the main point of the passage, but it's just an, a little nugget for us. Last week I, I talked about how we were reading this section about um, where the, the Jews listening at Pentecost were told to be baptized, and that, that really resonated with me. It's still it's something I'm chewing on. The idea of living as being baptized, not as being dunked, and just something you check off the box and move on, but living as one who is baptized. Um, that's been speaking to me. Was that the main point of the passage? No. That was just for me, I think. Maybe for some of you too. But I, I think it's the Lord speaking to me, saying, CJ, you're to live as a baptized follower of me. Does your life reflect that or not? It's a good question. Now, these little nuggets that stand out to us, we need to be cautious because we need to, to weigh what stands out to us with the rest of Scripture, which is why it's really important to know your Bible and be good friends with people who do as well. Um, because sometimes what stands out to us isn't sound doctrine. It's wrong. Now, the, my interpretation of being baptized and living as a baptized person, does that fit with, does that jive with the rest of Scripture? Sure. Sure. So, that's, it's Okay. Remember, the scriptures are multifaceted, and they contain many meanings, but we need to make sure that our interpretations are in line with like sound theology and biblical doctrine, which is why it's important to practice, we practice reading our Bibles in the regular. So when we make interpretations of the text, we need to approach them humbly and in community to learn from one another. And don't be afraid to share or form an opinion about a piece of text that ends up being wrong. I always get picked on for going on rabbit trails in my sermons sometimes and chasing things down. Do you know how many I chase down that end up being wrong? It happens all the time. I just don't present them up here, <laughs> right? I'm not doing this on the fly. That's what I'm saying. It's like the idea that you can chase these things down and you might come to a conclusion like, nope, that was wrong. That was an interesting idea, but that wasn't accurate. That's okay. Did I learn through the process? Absolutely. Don't be afraid to share. Our desire as we study the scriptures isn't to be right. It's to grow in our understanding together. Now, the next thing we do is the application piece. Now, we have to be careful about application, because sometimes when we read the Bible, we say it's like a, I love this one pastor says, we call it a roadmap to life. What's well, the most confusing roadmap ever, because there's no maps in it, and if you go to the maps in it, they're not very helpful, right? Because sometimes we read the Bible like it's just about us. It's not just about us. We remember, we read scripture aloud to remember who we are, who we're called to be, but more importantly, we read the scriptures to know who God is. And what, his, what he's doing, it highlights aspects of God's character, and, and sometimes we should just rest in that. Sometimes it's just about God, and that's okay. Now, sometimes when we learn things about God, it'll call us to action, like things like we learn about God's generosity and that we're called to be reflections of him, that maybe we're called to be generous as well. Sure, that's an application piece of that. But sometimes it's good just to sit in this and be in awe of who God is. Now, when you do talk about applications, though, when you do work on applications, sometimes we get really generalized. So we'll say, well, God is generous. This passage talks about God being generous, and we should be generous, too. Okay, everyone agree that we should all be generous? Yes, we should all be generous. Cool. Okay, see you next week. That's great. It's like the worst smart goal ever, though, right? So I would say, I would encourage you to drill down on specifics. In what areas of your life is God calling you to be increasingly generous? Who is he calling you to be increasingly generous with? In what way is he calling you to be increasingly generous? Be specific and do that not privately. We tend to do these things privately. Okay, everybody, just everyone go be generous. Don't ask any questions because it's just between you and God. Oh, I'm so tired of that phrase, okay? No, it's not between just you and God. It's between all of us and God. And it's not because I want to know your business. It's because we're a community of faith. And how do we pray for one another? How do we encourage one another? How do we bear one another's burdens if we don't even know what they are? 
How do we do community if we, oh, this is not on my, this is a rabbit trail, see? There we go. Um, but the idea that we need to share these things and be specific. Hey guys, I'm, I'm feeling called that I need to share my time more with my neighbor because I'm not creating time to even get to know them. How am I going to be able to minister to them and witness to them if I can't even talk to them? Now, who's going to talk to you about that other than your biblical community? You have to share that. It's like your New Year's resolutions. If you don't tell anybody about them, they're easy to just go, well, I'm going to cross that one off the list. You know what I mean? You didn't even accomplish it. All right, let's get back to text here. Uh, Finally, if we look at all the examples of reading scriptures aloud um, in the scriptures, most of them are part of some celebration of God and all that he's done. Remember, the public reading of scriptures is to remind us who God is, to to remind us what he's done, uh, and remind us who we are, what he's doing in the world, and then to celebrate those things. So as we read the scriptures, we should be encouraged and and desirous of worshiping and and, and celebrating. Um, In light of the world we face day in and day out, God is overall. He's the creator. He's the ruler. He's the king. He's generous and caring. And most of all, he's absolutely crazy about us. Should that bring us to joy, to a desire to celebrate? Absolutely. This is why we moved the sermon into the middle of the worship service, because it felt weird for us to wait till the end to have the sermon, hear the words of God, and then have, see you later. Why not give people opportunities to celebrate in prayer, in worship, in singing? Okay? The idea is let's respond. Let's respond. So, I mean, I will be honest with you, this is something we talk about on staff and in leadership a lot, is that we're not a church that's really great at celebration. How many times do you hear about an event that's going to happen or some class that's going to go on or whatnot, and we talk about it ahead of time a lot. And then we have the event, and it's great. And then it's like it never happened. We just don't celebrate. I want to celebrate the things that God has done. This is going to be different for us. The scriptures are to be celebrated, not just learned or studied. I think some of that is what makes them boring. Oh, I got to learn the Bible. Now, some of you type A people have written down these five steps and put them in order and have flow charts already done. How many have that already done? I think it's messier than that. I appreciate the respect and reverence that we give the scriptures, but honestly, sometimes um, it, it can become a barrier for us enjoying them. Does that make sense? Oh, I have to do this next. Oh, I have to do this next. Oh, I have to do this next. What I want to encourage you to do is have fun with it. Often when we read and discuss scriptures and community, we mix up the order, and that's, that's okay. Whenever I do this, I tend to, to not go in order because I tend not to be like a, you're like, I know, you're not a linear, I'm not a linear preacher or teacher, which you're like, I know, it's annoying, I wish you were, but uh, that's what it is. So I want to encourage you to feel some freedom with these guidelines. It's okay to mix up the order sometimes. It's okay to, to dance all over the place and mix interpretation and application and kind of wrestle with the text. That's okay. It's okay. Have fun with it. Now, on the way in, you've got this little bookmark of stuff in your Bible. Some of you, I've heard actually three people already today. It's my mistake. Nobody else's. I last minute said, hey, I have these little things that I made, and I thought we'd print them out and hand them out to people. But I didn't think about, these are impossible to read. So I will make bigger ones for next week, my bad. But uh, I just didn't think about it. It's my fault. Um, which I can't even read this, so here we go. Um, <laughs> the idea, these are just questions you can ask. Stick in your Bible. Okay? Um, I know sometimes it's hard to know, like, when you, how do I read the Bible with my kids? How do I read the Bible with my friends? How do I, you know, have a conversation or do this Jewish meditation literature thing? How do I do this? Um, do it with this. Pull it out and go, oh, what stands out to you? What does the text say? How is it saying it? Is it a poem? Um, what is it trying to say? Do I have a feeling about this text? Do I not like this? Why do I have that feeling? Wrestle with that stuff. Be honest and transparent. Feel free to say, I don't know. Free, feel, free to float something and say, you know, I'm not sure, but I think he brought up water in this text and water throughout the scriptures is always chaotic and, and scary. Why would he talk about water here then? I wonder if there's a connection. Matt Halverson's really good at sending me things like this. I saw this connection. Is it a connection? I'm like, I don't know. For you, maybe. So this is the formula that we're going to be reading Acts 2.42 through 47 like for the next several weeks. We're going to read it all together out loud. And I'll be up here sharing what I believe the translation and my interpretation of the text is. My convictions are about the application. But I hope it's just the start of a conversation. Don't just say, well, Pastor CJ said this, so he's right. I'm not often. Some of you are like, I know. (laughs) You're not often. I hope it's the start of a conversation. 
I hope you dig into the text with your families. I hope you talk about your Bible studies or your life groups or your friend groups. And I hope you feel free to disagree with me. I hope as you're wrestling through like the things that the early church was devoted to, you wrestle through these things. What does it mean to devote ourselves? What does it mean to devote myself to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, to breaking bread and to prayer? What does that look like in our family? How is our family devoted to breaking bread? And talk about it with your kids. Can your kids answer questions like that? Absolutely. Can you ask your kids what does it mean to be devoted to something? What does it look like when someone's devoted to something? Absolutely. Now, I don't know if you know this, but we have a group that does public reading of scripture every week on Thursday nights. In fact, they do a very truncated version of this. They seriously get together, I think they pray, and they read the scripture out loud, and then they go home. They really do. Um, Do you know what they do there? They read scripture out loud, just like we're called to, out of obedience, and and kids participate, and they're welcome to join in, and it happens on Thursday nights, and if you're interested, if you're new to the Bible, if you don't have a life group, and that's intimidating to walk into someone's home or to participate in some larger thing, this thing you can come to, participate if you want to, you can just listen, you don't have to read, but just come be a part of it on Thursdays. If you want more information, check out our website or uh, the newsletter. So, Reading scripture out loud and discussing it is the formula that we're going to be addressing Acts 2 with over the next several weeks. The last part I want to go through is the framework of how this text is written specifically in Acts 2. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Acts chapter 2, and this is where we're going to camp the rest of the day today. I know these are, I used to get eye rolls, I probably still do, they just do it behind my back now, uh, when I bring up Acts 2.42 through 47, because it's a passage of scripture that's, that I honestly don't like. I mean, initially I didn't like it. I guess I'm in love with it now. I just don't know how to do it. I'm an introvert who loves the woods and a good book. That's my jam. And this calls me to live in community with other people, like day by day. (laughs) Yeah, not my jam. And I don't know how to do it because people are messy. And I do it wrong. And any any other introverts have a hard time, like you have to feel, I, I call it peopling, like, this is what humans do. <laughs> you know, like, I go, this is how people interact with one another. Like small talk, I run out of the first, like, how's the weather? It looks nice outside. How are you doing? And then there's that awkward pause where I have to come up with something. Like, okay, what do, what do people talk about now? I can't just jump into like some scriptural reference about, you know, some silly thing I was reading about agriculture in the ancient, ancient world. No one wants to hear about that except me. And unless I want to do all the talking, you don't ask questions like that. So, but what happened is like 10 years ago, I was reading through the New Testament, I just came upon this, this book of Acts, and there was this little snapshot of the early church that stood out to me, and I was conflicted because it was so different from what I saw on the, on the weekly in modern day churches. So I brought it up to my, to my uh, peers and my mentors, and my thoughts were often honestly just dismissed. They were like, okay, enough, that's not prescriptive, you're not supposed to do that. Luke is just telling you what happened then, that's all. But the more I thought about it, the more I felt convicted by it. I've said it up here a lot of times, ancient authors aren't newscasters. They don't just tell you what happened, they're teaching. So my question is, what what is Luke teaching? He's not just telling that this happened. He could have told us all kinds of things that happened. He singled this out in a very weird spot, by the way. Um, And he tells us what this church looked like, what it looked like day to day. Why, what was he doing? He knew this book would be read in churches all over the ancient world and he was teaching. So the question is, what was he teaching? Now, as I further studied the book of Acts, I saw that another snapshot showed up again in Acts 4, another in in Acts 5, another in Acts 9. Why would Luke keep bringing this early church up? It was this beautiful, unified, diverse, and devoted church. He's clearly teaching something, so it led me to go, what what is he teaching here? And we're still wrestling through it. I still don't know. Now, what happened is, uh, remember the snapshot in Acts 2.42 it starts immediately after the Sermon at Pentecost, where we know that there's, a, there's great diversity in the family of God as people were from all over the place speaking dozens of languages. Some people who became converts didn't return to their homes, but instead stayed in Jerusalem to continue to worship with the early church. They'd been converted, and they're like, they gave up everything, and they're staying here. So there are thousands of people following Jesus, being filled by the Holy Spirit, and they're meeting in hundreds of houses. You need to think about this. This wasn't like a one, ga- one big gathering. It was hundreds of houses. Sometimes they think four to 600 houses where these people were meeting as little cell groups daily. They'd, gather, they'd flood into the synagogues to hear the, 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 the words of God in the Old Testament shared, and then they would wrestle with them in light of Christ's resurrection. 
So it was it's this, this little snapshot has a picture of what they did, how they lived, and what the Lord did in their midst. So let's start with verse 42, and we'll kind of walk through it really quickly. It says in Acts 2.42, And they, those gathered, those Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. So after these Jewish followers of Jesus repent and they're baptized, they receive the Holy Spirit, they devote themselves to four things. The apostles' teachings. What's that? The scriptures, right? It was the oral scriptures, okay? The fellowship. Gathering together. The breaking of bread. I think this is both communion and eating together. There's something special that happens when we eat together. And prayers. Both prayers for one another and the recited prayers that were recited every day. Now know what's included and what's not. They don't devote themselves to generosity. Is generosity bad? No. It's a fruit. They don't devote themselves to evangelism, to programs or events, to capital campaigns, to building churches or even community centers, even to planting churches. They didn't do any of that initially. Their devotion, first and foremost, was to to the disciplines that unite, educate, and orient themselves to the Lord, His Spirit, and to one another. Their devotion to these things, what happens is, they lead to a transformation in the hearts and actions of these followers of Jesus in Acts 2.43. It says, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So they devoted themselves to these four things, and what happens? Awe happens. Does anyone else in the Bible have a footnote there? I think I left the footnotes even on the back of the sermon notes there. What does it say at the bottom? What's awe? Can be translated as? Fear. Fear, okay? A word we don't like. Ah, phobos is the the Greek word, okay? Um, Ah, or fear of the Lord came upon them as they devoted themselves to knowing their God, who they are, who they're called to be, and knowing how God is working in the world through his kingdom. That awe came upon what? Every soul. It says soul. We've talked about this here too. Soul, the word soul. We think that the body and soul are two different things and the soul goes to heaven, this idea. That's that's Plato, guys. It's not the Bible. Okay, let's just be, be clear, okay? This word in Greek is psyche. It means inner self, mind, heart, that which gives animate life and distinction to human beings, the part that makes a human human, all of it. So fear and awe came upon their very hearts, mind, soul, and strength. This fear and awe came upon them, and they they didn't pursue after it. It happened to them. The Spirit moved and transformed their hearts, minds, lives, their soul, their psyche. Okay, with me? So he transformed, they they, they devote themselves to these four things, the spirit moves and transforms them, and then what happens? Many wonders and signs are being done through the apostles. This is the people of God seeing how God is working in both natural and supernatural ways. When you come to faith in God and when when the Holy Spirit stirs in your heart, don't you start to see God everywhere? Let me put it another way. When you buy a red car, aren't all cars red after that? I mean, it's a silly analogy, but that's kind of what happens. You start to see how God works in the small and in the big things. And so I don't want to dismiss this wonders and signs as just being miraculous things. Sometimes it is miraculous things, but it's the everyday miracles that we miss all the time, and we see them. So they see this happening, and then what happens? Verse 44, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, the hippie verses, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. So they were unified and had all things in common. I think this means both thought and action. They shared what they had physically and what they believed theologically. Uh, Is unity something they strove for? No. It was something that came from being transformed by the Spirit of God. By focusing on the Lord, uh, my, uh, our marriage counselor, like we had a marriage counselor when our second year of marriage was a really rough year for us. Um, Well, a couple years, but uh, what happened is our marriage counselor talked about being tied, tethered to the Lord. And that even if we felt far apart, if we're both tethered to the same place as we're growing closer to him, what happens to us? I think this is what happens for the church, too. When we are in active pursuit and devotion together at the Lord, if we're on mission together, trying to build our relationship with Jesus Christ, we can't help but find ourselves connected increasingly to one another. This is what happened. So fear of the Lord happens, and it worms its way throughout the scriptures. I mean, funny, Karen's going to talk about fear of the Lord throughout the scriptures, because fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, is the being of wisdom, recognizing who God is and who we are, and and that bringing us to a a reverent understanding of him and his character, as well as our role in his good world, causes us to act in ways that are different. His spirit transforms us, and we begin to live as we were designed to. This is called wisdom. 
from the Bible. This is what it calls to live a wise life. Unity is fruit of wisdom. It comes from, uh, through the receiving of the wisdom of the Lord. They were also transformed in their thinking about material things. In light of the kingdom of heaven, the things of this world became less important. They saw the needs of others as their own needs. They became open-handed with their possessions, with all that they had. Uh, their hearts were transformed by the Holy Spirit because of their repentant devotion to the disciplines of a disciple. You see, generosity and selflessness must be evidence of a changed heart, not something we reluctantly devote ourselves to. So we're not going to, you don't hear me say up here that you need to tithe. Is tithing important? Sure it is. Is it good to, like, if you have a heart that's hard and doesn't feel inclined to do so, should we force ourselves to do that? I know we hear faith that you make it a lot of times. I know we hear that. But generosity, from what I see, and you can disagree with me, in the New Testament, is it, it's a fruit of a transformed heart. That we start, what I want for our congregation, for every member of our congregation, even those that are visiting, is that I want you to have a heart inclined for the Lord, and I want him to call you to be generous in whatever way he calls you to be generous. You understand? It's about, it's, it's a fruit. I want to see your fruit because evidence of a changed heart. Because I, I want all of our hearts to be transformed, to be increasingly generous like the Lord, right? So uh, biblical generosity is not measured by just what's given, but how it's given, from what type of heart. It continues to uh, actually hear more and more about this in Acts 2, 46. And day by day, there's that hard word, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. So the Spirit transforms their hearts, and they find themselves desiring increasingly to be in this biblical community, to continue in fellowship, to break bread together, to celebrate the new creation, the kingdom coming to bear in this world together. This leads to them worshiping and fellowshipping together, leading to further transformation. They find that as their hearts are transformed, it's funny, it says that they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. That's how it happens, isn't it? When you start to see the blessings that God has given you, and you recognize that he continually gives them, and it's not a one-time thing, we tend to be more open-handed with stuff, don't we? I don't have to have a huge savings account to depend on anymore, because my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Does he know what my needs are? No, that's escaped, and that's beyond God's grasp. He can't figure out CJ's aisles, you know. His cell phone bill is too hard, too high, too much for God. That's not the case. If he knows, when he gives, I need to know, if I see someone else with a need, I can give it and not doubt, because God will provide. I don't have to provide for myself. I don't have to worry about that. So they're thankful for God's blessing, and they find themselves being increasingly generous. And then these people really realize that all things come from the Lord. He provides for all that they need, and they don't need to hold on to his blessings because he does it all the time. So they celebrate. They celebrate this ability to be generous. Uh, so generosity, thankfulness, worship, praising God all come this, through this transformation. And through all this, what happens, the surrounding culture falls in love with these people. And this culture, they're like, those guys are really cool. In fact, in all the extra biblical writings that we have, do you know how they talk about Christians? Even the people who are killing them actively, do you know how they talk about them? They're hardworking. They're kind. They really do love each other. They believe this whole resurrection thing. They take care of one another's needs. I can kill one, and the other ones will take care of their family. They have nothing but nice things to say about these people. The persecution they receive is from religious leaders of the day, and later those who make money from sinful practices. They're like, hey, they're costing me money because I make idols, and uh, no one's worshiping idols anymore. Right? It's crazy. They were very well liked. And then look at how it closes. It says, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. saved. Who added to the number? So it wasn't some tract or evangelistic gimmick or program. It wasn't clever preaching or amazing music. It wasn't fancy buildings or, or really welcoming people. The Lord used their devotion to biblical community to transform these people into what they were created to be, who were organically evangelistic in nature. They can't help but talk about Jesus. They can't stop. And so they keep doing it. They just keep doing it. And this organically drew people to the church. Now, we desire to be a church that takes seriously our pursuit of the Lord through devotion to the same things this early church devoted itself to and allow God to transform us and hopefully the culture around us just like he did in the first century. We believe that if we devote ourselves to these things that we'll find ourselves in awe, in fear of the Lord as well, our hearts and minds will be transformed. And as that happens, we'll find ourselves witnessing the words of God and, and further seeing ourselves transformed, holding less and less tightly to the things of this world, becoming generous as he's been generous with us, becoming thankful as we recognize that he, all that he's blessed us with, becoming desirous of lives wholly devoted to him, spending our days praising God, having favor with all people, finding ourselves a part of what God is doing in this world, day by day, hopefully welcoming people into God's family, all the ones he's bringing through the church. So that's the formula. It's actually not that complex, right? This is the framework. This is how we're going to engage the text over the next several weeks. We're going to read it together. We're going to translate it. We're going to interpret it. We're going to seek to know how to apply it. And then we're going to celebrate it. Because this is good news, amen? Amen. amen. And we're going to do it all together in the little community. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for this text. It is so convicting to me. It goes against everything my uh, natural inclinations wants to do. I want private time alone with you in the woods but you call us to something more. I know that all the leaps and bounds that you've made in my life where you've transformed my heart in the deepest way it's been done in community. This biblical community drum that I keep banging is not just some weird desire from a guy who likes to hang out with people. It's because it's what you called us to. None of us are experts. We're all people in process. We're all learning together. Some of us have been to seminary. Some of us have just opened the Bibles for the first time today. But none of us have a, 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 a corner on, on what happened and what the scriptures mean. We're all a participating member of this. So I pray, Father, that we would, we would step into this. 
I know this, this text, you see this, and it's like world and life transforming. Look at the first verse. They devoted. I pray, Father, we'd be a devoted people. It wasn't an individual devoted, but it does take an individual statement for us to decide to be devoted to you, Lord. But let's do it corporately. Let's do it together as a body of Christ. Let's be devoted to the things that incline our hearts for you. They, they put us on deck for your spirit to transform us. We ask this all in your son's name. Amen. So this next song, um, as we're talking about being devoted um, as the church, not just as individuals, um, it just makes sense that we talk about, sing the song about resurrendering our lives to Christ, um, being the church, that we are his people, that um, he cleans out um, just the things that we hold on to so that we can be holy as he is, that we can devote ourselves to the things that he's called us to be devoted to and just be his church and his people here. So would you stand and join us for resurrender? Turning all the tables and calling for return to our lives upon the altar, the things we did at first. We're cleaning out the temple, we're cleaning out the turf. Holy are your territory, holy are your church. We are your people, you are our God. We are your temple, make us holy.
reminder this morning just that um, that God does the work through us, that we have the opportunity to put our faith and our trust in him, that we devote ourselves to him, and the rest of it is all work through his Holy Spirit through us. And so that's, I think that's my takeaway this morning is just that reminder that I don't have to do it all. My step one is to make sure that my heart is in the right place, that I am following as closely as I can to my Savior, and that the rest of it is all work that he'll do through me, and he will do through us as a church. So that's my prayer for us this morning. I invite you to to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I pray that as a congregation this morning, that we would be a group of people, a family of brothers and sisters who are devoting ourselves closely to you, God. That when we are waking up in the morning, when we're going about our day, as we go to bed at night, that our praises to you would be on our lips, that we would be asking ourselves questions. Are we following you? Is this what you would have us do, God? And and just using um, all of the little miracles, the everyday things that you do in our lives to be reminders of what a great God we serve. Thank you for um, the message this morning, for this upcoming series, for us to learn how to become the church that you desire us to be. I also want to pray this morning as we are considering our tithes and our offerings that we would be able to do so with generous hearts, God. Help us to be happy givers, however you would call us to give. If that's something we would desire to do, our generosity would come with a joyful heart. Please bless the gifts that are brought this week and um, help us as a church to use them the way that you would have us, that we might be a blessing to others and share um, the good news that we know through you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to close today with that celebration component. Just a reminder of how great our God is, the wonderful works he's done in our lives, and that we know he will continue to do so. So let's celebrate together and say great things. Oh,
His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom. So I said it wasn't that complicated, right? And it's not. It's not. So thinking about this idea, okay, God has called us to do something, so he's called us to, to reflect, and like, is there an application piece, be specific, that I can do? Can I read the scriptures aloud, even in my own devotional by myself, as weird as that feels to do? Maybe that's your baby step. Maybe it's reading at your table, and like, I'll read with my kids while we eat dinner around the kitchen table. If you need a Bible for that, Grab one in the back. Grab two in the back. Grab seven in the back. Sorry, Candace. Um, but just <laughs> if you need a Bible, grab a Bible, man. We're going we're gonna to break that barrier. What is it? Write down that thing. Be specific. But then you also can't do it alone. So who are you going to tell? Who's your biblical community? Your family? Your friends? The people you have coffee with? Coworkers? Okay, do it in community. It's my encouragement. Next week, we get to practice celebrating. So I'd also encourage you, we have a lot of people getting baptized, and so it's going to be a lot of uh, crazy celebration here today, uh, next week. Um, really exciting, so I hope you'll come for that, too. And um, we also want the kids really to see that as well. So if you have kids, grandkids, or whatever, we want them to come and celebrate with our family as well. So let me pray, and then we can go ahead and get on out of here, continue worshiping at home. Uh, Father God, I just thank you for this body. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to, to come together and worship you, to dig into your word together, to read it aloud, to seek to interpret it, seek to understand you 
more, to understand ourselves more, to understand who you've called us to be, and to understand how it is you're working in our world. Bless us this week, Father. May we take seriously your word. It's not, it's not a matter of once we know, once we feel you speak, once we feel the Spirit's prompting, once we know, it's a matter of obedience or disobedience. So work in our hearts, Father. Help us to be obedient to you, to devote ourselves to you just like the early church did, and be confident that you will work through us like you work through them. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.